And we've returned. Wow, what a funky music. Every time that thing comes on, it's like, God, I always forget how cool that is. Uh, real quick, before we get the show started, I just want to say special thanks to Jared Gleason for making that song. It is so cool. Uh, he did make it specifically for us, so I know yes. YouTube out there. It's used with uh, permission. Yeah, you guys keep trying to hit us with copyright <laughs> stuff, but uh, either way, it doesn't matter. It is our song, and it's great. Uh, welcome back to another episode. My hat is doing some weird fuzzy things but whatever uh we (laughs) we are some nobodies and this show is talking upstream my name is zach and over there is dylan got it yeah and what we are is we are content creators we are media makers we are ground shakers uh we do a bunch of weird stuff you can find most of our things at some nobodies.com um and yeah we we just do weird things right (laughs) that's it uh yeah And we call the show Talking Upstream because what we're trying to do is talk ourselves up to a streaming service. Uh, We're trying to uh, get in somebody's back pocket and be like, hey, these guys have nonstop ideas, so let's give them a very little bit amount of money for a lot of stuff. Uh, But before we get anything going, Dylan, how are you, sir? Doing all right, Zach. Yeah. Yeah? It's a beautiful, non-named day because we're recording this ahead of time. (laughs) Yeah, it is, a, it, it is a gorgeous, probably Sunday. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm great, man. I'm great. I, I, I'm loving this show. I'm liking the content that we're creating. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really fueling us. Uh, the last episode, we came up with a very cool idea. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm excited for today's episode. Yeah. Do you want to introduce today's guest, pretty please? Yeah, so we have today independent filmmaker, writer, director, short film guy, Peter J.S. Regan. Uh, I think I said that right. You can correct me when I bring him on right now. Hey, everybody. And Dylan was right. That is how you say my name, Peter J.S. Regan. So there you go. Well done. Good start. (laughs) All right. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Regan, before Dylan uh, tells me all the things that you've done, do you want to quickly just give uh, everyone listening or watching like a quick summary of who you are and the things you've done? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, uh, as we said before, it's Peter J.S. Regan, and I'm a filmmaker. I do a lot of short films. I'm also a studio manager at a, a studio in East Liberty in Pittsburgh as well. So I uh, actually just started doing that. I'm very happy about it. I have a YouTube channel called Peter Presents, which at the moment focuses on Homer's Iliad, that really old book that everybody knows about, but few people really get into anymore. So it's all about that. It's my favorite book. I also, let's see, um, I do all kinds of other art stuff in general. I mean, leather work, bead work, metal working. I like to work with my hands a lot, and I'm also a big history buff, which informs a lot of the work that I do. So I guess that's a pretty decent, you know, intro on what I'm about. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Yeah. So when do you find time to write anything and all that? Uh, Well, that's a good question. Um, Typically, the way that I write usually is I'll work with an idea in my head before I actually start typing it up. So instead of kind of sitting at a blank page trying to come up with something, I'll have something ready beforehand and I you know, you can think while you're doing anything. So I'll come up with stuff like that. Um, But usually whenever I do write something, the first draft is always by hand first. It's just easier for me to like uh, have it flow with my thoughts a bit better. So I've got, you know, tons and tons of notebooks everywhere and sketchbooks and things like that. But I don't know. I've just always found time. When I was a little kid, I started bringing a spiral bound notebook everywhere I everywhere I went, uh, including within the house, you know, and just in case I had an idea and then I would, and I'd write it down. So I've always been pretty good about finding time to, uh, write out my creative ideas. So, yeah. 
in uh like in your early life like what do you remember anything sparking this want this desire for creation was it a movie or a, i mean maybe it was even homer uh but was it <laughs> yeah do you remember like what it was that maybe sparked that creative side of you well my family has always been a very creative group of people but when it came into filmmaking i had an idea for a film with a couple of friends of mine when we were about 11 years old or something like that and we just had this idea about a movie. It was going to be about some kids who, like, you know, pretend to go on an adventure and it's intercut with the kids going on the adventure and then seeing what they're thinking. So it goes from like high fantasy to like this kind of adorable comedy sort of an idea. And I told my buddies, I was like, I'll write the script. I didn't even know how to format a script. So I kind of like, and I didn't know how to make any, I didn't know how movies worked at all. And so I'd write some idea that I'd like to see and then I'd go figure out how we would eventually do that if we ever shot it and that kind of got me into figuring out how filmmaking works uh, but at that point it was just kind of a hobby for a while mm -hmm. the moment where I realized like I've got to make movies I was actually watching The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe the Disney one which mm -hmm. isn't my favorite movie although I think it's you know, criminally underrated. I think it's a really good movie, a great adaptation of a book that I love. And I was raised with those books, mm -hmm. the Narnia books, right? And I'm sitting in the movie theater and I'm watching this movie and I was already kind of thinking like beforehand, like, oh man, I wish I had gotten to make this before them. You know, I was like 13, 14 or something like that. And there's a shot in the movie where Mr. Tumnus the Fawn is walking away from the lamppost with Lucy Pevensey in this wood that's covered in snow, all right? And there, it's just a really short, like maybe a second and a half long wide shot where they're just walking away. And it was really weird because I, I, I can't even remember the first time I heard that story from the books mm -hmm. or the radio theater version of it. And I had imagined that moment exactly like that snowflake for snowflake like completely in my mind's eye that's what it looked like <laughs> and so when i was in the movie theater i went like whoa how'd that get in there and it was the first time i got to see my imagination up on screen i didn't even have to put the work in for it uh, but i got the sensation of it of like seeing what's inside your head up in front of you and i was like <laughs> all right let's get more of that you know <laughs> was really, i was so uh enamored by it and i was like all right rest of your life here's what we're doing so right. and that's what i've been going for yeah oh. so that was right. the moment that was the moment you, you seem to do a lot of like genre stuff at least the short stuff i've seen whether mm. it's like editing on lightsabers to like baseball bats or doing harry like spell stuff um did you was that part of your drive to like, do you do teach yourself um, kind of special effects like that as well? Or did that just kind of come about because you like doing genre stuff? And All right. Well, uh, the answer to that question is, um, well, firstly, I didn't initially teach myself special effects. I actually did take a class for that. And it was brilliant. It was just an after effects class. And... Uh, by, I think, halfway through the semester, the like we were making all this great stuff, and then the professor said, all right, well, we've gone through everything After Effects basically has to offer, so at this point, anything that comes out or anything you want to do, you can either figure it out or you know how to hmm. understand any tutorial you're going to get. And so that gave me a really great foundation, and I pursued it from there. But yeah, I did not start out doing any special effects mm -hmm. like that and which i'm really glad that i didn't start off doing that um so the way that that kind of came about was there's a film i'm working on still which is a sci-fi film that i'm finishing and in post-production for it and it uh, before I greenlit the project, I got a bunch of animators involved with it. I had never had any animation in any of my work before. And so it was this really, really super ambitious project, you know, kind of bite off a little more than you can chew, but don't spit it out, you know, force it down. And, um, but as the project went on, 
uh, for different reasons, animators left or I threw them off the project sometimes, but like, or just like thing or shooting went on too long for in some of the cases as well. So it was just sort of like some of it fizzled out with the animators and mm -hmm. there's a little more to it than that, but I won't go into all the drama. Uh, but basically it, I got myself into a scenario where I needed to become an animator. And which is its own totally different thing <laughs> from filmmaking. Mm -hmm. But I was like, okay, well, I'll just become an animator then. And I really dove into learning uh, the basics of elements and principles of animation, uh, hand-drawn animation, traditional animation, got into 3D animation, and then eventually into the compositing and after effects, which normally is not <laughs> the order people go in to learn these things. And, uh, but I became, uh, I, I got pretty good at it is what ended up happening. And then, yeah, the, my, I, I focus a lot on genre stuff, although a lot of my projects have just been straight dramas. Uh, but yeah, my, my goal is to do more fantastic genre work in general. And rather than having to go to somebody else for that all the time, uh, being able to do it myself, but that also has, given me the ability to communicate with other animators and After Effects people really well, which is good because with the project that a bunch of the animators, like that that whole thing went off the rails, um, uh, I'm continuing it and I'm doing a lot of, most of the work on it at this point, but there's a couple other animators that I've brought on who are doing some of the work with me and they're more advanced in some areas than I am. And, but I'm able to communicate with them because I understand how it works. So I don't just say, hey, can you make this spaceship do something? Like it, it ends up being uh, a more cohesive vision. It works better with the actual live action footage we have. Uh, so it, it's been a huge long process, but yeah, I, I got into a position where in order to finish some of my projects, I just kind of needed to master After Effects and I did. And I continue to pursue that and get better at it and see what, comes out but uh yeah so but yeah it's definitely for fantasy sci-fi that was the idea but even uh some of my later projects with that aren't genre work really uh i do like i touch up lens distortion i'm always doing something in after effects to mess with it afterward so being an indie filmmaker, you are probably very well uh, averse to like, you know, writing a script, uh, uh, directing it, being the cinematographer technically and the editing and everything else. What would you say as far as the filmmaking process is your favorite point of it? It's working with actors through a scene, definitely. There's nothing better for me. Uh, there's nothing that I think that I'm necessarily even better at doing, even though that's one of the things I feel like I have the most to learn about. Uh, but when we have a good script and we have good actors that I don't have to necessarily trick into acting, you know, <laughs> stuff like, like, I don't, mm -hmm. if, like, which is its own kind of directing and that's legitimate, I guess. Like what, what I mean by tricking people into acting is when you're doing a close up and they're supposed to be looking over a field of dead bodies and looking grim. When you tell them like, look bored. And they go, you know, and it's <laughs> like, they're just, they're just thousand miles stare or whatever. And you cut that with them looking at a bunch of dead bodies and it works. But I, I try to not do that anymore. <laughs> I try to work with actors who like I can uh, work with on a, a deeper level, I would say. Uh, once again, whatever gets the shot works, you know, <laughs> but uh, it, for me, What's more, uh, what I get more enjoyment, fulfillment, and what my best work is, frankly, is when I'm able to work through a scene with the actors, mm -hmm. where we look at the script, we talk about the characters, and we really figure out the story of what's going on in it. So that's, that's what it is for me, for sure. Now, on the other end of that, as an independent filmmaker, what do you think is the most difficult part of the entire production process? Uh, finishing the film would probably be high on that list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, difficult. Let me think about that one. Um, 
Honestly, the produce like this is going to sound like a big part of it, but the producing side of filmmaking with the you know getting everybody's schedules organized, uh, even like in in some cases getting the budget together. Although that really depends on the project itself, because sometimes that's not really a big problem. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just uh, my my dream job ultimately is to. Uh, be a director who is not producing the film, who is working with the actors and has the vision for the piece, but is able to communicate with all the department heads effectively, you know, like work with the animation, the wardrobe, all those mm -hmm. guys, and uh, not have to, and, and have a little bit of input on the script. But even though I love writing, I love the creative process and coming up with stuff, endless ideas, whatever. Uh, I'm not in any way against making something somebody else wrote. You know, I only got into writing because I couldn't find anybody who would write for me. So, um, and with the, also with the project where my buddies and I were getting together, but I only really kept up with writing and then eventually learned to really love it, you know, but yeah, my main thing is just direct. So if I could get a producer, you know, <laughs> to handle all that other stuff, um, which a lot of people think is directing because when you do independent filmmaking, if you are directing, chances are you have to do that in the same way that a lot of people think what the assistant director does is what the director does. It's like, well, no, that's what the director does if they don't have an assistant director, you know? <laughs> so, um, and a lot of people don't realize that, you know, some people think, oh, I want to do this, this, this. It's like, oh, you don't want to work with actors. You want to tell these guys what to do and make things work, you know? <laughs> so yeah, but produce, I, I know it's a big one. It's like, I can do it, but definitely the thing I struggle with the most is just the actual um, logistics of the production. It's, I, that that's it really when it comes to like writing new projects do you give yourself like do you give yourself uh like writing deadlines or are you even trying to be consistent with writing or would you prefer to just kind of like take ideas and you know put your emotions and your thought behind it well it depends on the project uh there's some things that uh i like if i have an opportunity to do a really uh, yeah, if I have a really great opportunity to do some project with a certain group of people, then yeah, I don't want that to get cold. I'll strike while the iron's hot. On the other hand, there was a script that I wrote with a friend of mine who he and I had never written together before. And that script took years, <laughs> right? You know, we were doing other stuff at the same time. Like, it's like I made several, I, several shorts between the time we started and finished writing that thing. Uh, but that was one where we weren't as concerned about, we got to get the script done so much as like, whatever we can think of to get this thing right, you know, is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it does depend on the situation uh, as far as the deadlines. Like I can get something written, like I, I can finish writing something when I need to. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I don't have to, it's going to take longer. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not sure what you mean of the second part of your question with like putting your own emotions into it. Like how, how's that different from the time frame? So for, for me, like my, my thought process usually is, is kind of uh, in the same bubble. It's like uh, either sci-fi or horror or something. But if I ever come across a script of something that I would never have thought of, then I think that I would give those characters a slightly different point of view than the person writing it because it wasn't my idea. So now I have to force myself oh, into that okay. thought process. So taking somebody else's like kind of concept and then putting your emotion and your vision to it versus creating something that maybe somebody else can put their vision on. Right. Okay. Uh, I think I get that a bit better. There's, um, uh, I'm going to be saying it depends on the project a lot because that's how I deal with every facet of my life, you know, <laughs> but yeah. mm -hmm. um, not just film, but anything. But uh, so for if someone handed me a script that they had written, if it was a historical story, as if this is a historical film that we're looking at making, 
then what I would do is definitely take a lot of time to study the history of it. Even if it's like recent history, you know, like if, if it's a true story, so scrap the word history. If it's a true story, I'm going to look at what actually happened. Um, if it's, and because one of the things that I, there's this balance in filmmaking between being an artist who has their own voice and being a storyteller who's able to represent people outside of themselves. Even if you might share some idea of a common humanity, although what I mean by that and what almost everybody else means by that are totally different things. But like you, like you, you should be able to honestly present a character that you have nothing in common with and that you don't agree with. And um, without necessarily making them the villain of the story. Like you should be able to do that. And it's, you know, it's cause it's weird to try and be more objective with something that's supposed to be a very emotional medium <laughs> and all that. But uh, yeah, I think if someone gave me a script and I just liked the script, then I would probably have some ideas to, you know, you know oh, hey, we could without, adding any money or time to it. What if they do this? Like there was to give an example. Um, we were writing a script one time. Uh, I was writing a script with two other people and in the script, one of the guys, like someone burgs their eggs in the morning and it's supposed to set off like they, they're having a bad day. Right. And in the script at first they, you know, they said like, okay, so the person comes in and they, the fire alarm goes off or whatever <laughs> smoke detector. And then the actor yells, you know, a S H I T. All right. I know we're not swearing on here, so, but just, you know, and at the top of their lungs. And I just, I, I don't have a problem with that, but I just said, okay, so that's the first idea, but what's something else that could happen here? You know, it's like on the one hand, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, it's easy to identify with, but and it's not, I'm not gonna be like, Oh, that's cliche. It's like, no, people actually do that, whatever. But so what's something maybe we could make it funnier or something like that, or make it just a little bit more unique in some way. And so it just ended up, we cut any line where the person comes over to their eggs to see if they can save them. And they look at them and they're burnt and they stop. And then they just flip the pan onto the floor and like, just walk away. <laughs> like they just say, bam, you know, and go off. And it's all in the action. Cause originally it was like off screen. They yell voice over that word. Mm -hmm. And then, but I was like, well, can we let the actor do more with it? Can we let their body language show it? Can we make it funny? It'll add a little bit more charisma, just that kind of thing. And, you know, people can do that for almost any script. Like, even if it's made by, written by one of the greatest writers ever or something, you can have a great actor who comes on and they're thinking about that character and they'll uh, do something with it. So I'm not against... Uh, I'm not against fiddling with any script at all. Uh, it's very different from plays and like on stage, the, you know, the script is the book and you don't mess with it. You can't change anything. Film, it's fluid. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a position to have an idea about it, it might actually work. So let's hear it. So, yeah, but I, but I don't want to take someone else's like, you know, uh, was it if, if someone wrote like a script they're really into and it's like their personal thing and like I'm gonna take it to a degree they don't really own it anymore but if I'm gonna change it beyond recognition I just shouldn't take that script I should just make something else so and I think the only reason why people do that kind of thing where they take somebody's script and then change it beyond recognition is because they have an opportunity to do a project and it doesn't really matter what it is as long as this person wrote it and it like just becomes a career move for them, which, hey, I, I understand the rationale behind that. I'm going to try to avoid doing that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> um, at least I I'd, I'd hope I do that with like if i if i went along those lines i hope i'd talk to the writer first because i don't want to be a complete jerk about it uh <laughs> but that's but you also can't be too in love with the script it's like you got to respect it but you also got to rip it apart as well uh you've talked a little you talked a little bit just then about like what it takes to put stuff on a page and editing stuff um 
is there a specific kind of like process you go through when you do a script? Do you outline heavily? Like how do you capitalize on any sort of ideas that you come across? All right. So um, a lot of the time what I focus on now is getting to the core of what the film is really about, not just what's happening. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Lord of the Rings, what's happening? A bunch of people are trying to destroy jewelry. All right. Well, but that's not what it's really about. That's not why you really watch it. It's like, oh, well, it's got orcs and dwarves and elves and all these fantastic things. It's like, well, so does every D&D manual, and there's only a certain number of people who read those, and that number is a lot smaller than the people who watch those movies. Mm -hmm. So what, what is it really about? And then you start to really see, like, you know, you delve into it always gets to the characters and the themes, and the ultimate theme of Lord of the Rings is death. That's that's the ultimate thing, according to Tolkien himself. Um, but he uh, was his observation was that any long epic that anybody ever was able to finish on a consistent basis, the main theme was always death, and which is I, I think a fascinating observation from the master himself. So, mm -hmm. um, but I'll I'll think about that kind of thing, you know, like okay, this is you know about a father trying to connect with his son, you know, like that's what it's really about, you know, or uh, like there's some family element, or there's a, a survival element, or something to that degree. Like what's what's the core of it? And even the core of it might just be like, yo, it's gonna be fun, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to a degree. Like, hey, let's just make an awesome movie. It'll be great. Um, and you gotta kind of be a little more specific than that, but you, you get what I'm saying, I think. So when I'm writing, a lot of the time, um, my one of the ways that I uh, sort of practice an idea for writing, like before I start writing and then while I'm writing and even while I'm working on something, what I will do is I will actually tell the story to people, whether it's in a writing room or with the actors or I'm just with a friend and they're like, hey, what are you working on? And I'll just tell them the story because if I can't articulate the story in a way that is exciting or interesting, like verbally, as well, then it's going to be more difficult for me to do that on film, even though not everybody's like that. There's some people who are better with the camera than they are with their words, perhaps. But I find that there's a connect there where if I'm able to tell the story at the bar or something and make everybody laugh while I'm talking about this crazy scene and he's like, and he doesn't know it, but they're dead or something. And, and they end up um, and, and they're able and they, like the joke lands and they laugh or they cry or whatever it happens to be, then I'm able to kind of be like, all right, these are the important beats of the story. This is what's important. And as you're telling it to people, you start to realize, wait, I'm, they're getting bored here. This isn't serving the plot. You know, why don't we cut that? <laughs> you know, and um, you know, just really trim it up. So I try to, if it's a short film, even I'll try to just bullet point on my fingers, like, what's going on it's like okay uh the mom dies the uncle comes over and realizes she wasn't there when the mom died there's this whole thing he realizes it's time travel they go to the hospital she goes she gets to say goodbye to her mom and then the aftermath they're in the car <laughs> and she gets to say thanks to her uncle and they drive away happy you know like just that sort of arc of a story yeah, kind of just, and then and then yeah so and like this because of that sort of a deal mm -hmm. but like yeah just Getting the gist of it, so, and, and which that, but that's also just kind of like the stories that I try to tell most of the time, because there's also movies where they work out great, but that's not how they're built at all. Like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I'm not going to spoil any movies, by the way, because that's go where for people go to hell for doing that. And I, <laughs> anyway, but the, um, <laughs> if I was dictator of the universe, there'd be a few people I'd kill. The ones who talk in the movie theaters and the one who tell me how movies end. But the, um, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, like, so once upon a time in Hollywood. Okay. That's not necessarily a story that is very obviously like, one thing leads into another. A lot of it's kind of like a slice of life. It's like, hey, here's kind of what it was like back then, what it would be like for this kind of actor. And you're just kind of hanging out with these people for most of the movie. 
there is a story that goes on and there is a plot and they do have their problems, but it's not like, it's not really a plot driven film. And it's cause it's not supposed to be. Quentin Tarantino who made Once Upon a Time in Hollywood can do that. And he knows when he is doing that, but he also knows when he doesn't want to, you know, when he wants to go sit with somebody and be mm -hmm. like, yeah, wouldn't it be cool if like, you were this stunt man and you're driving around LA for 45 minutes listening to the radio. Can you imagine, you know, like, uh, so that's, um, so yeah, it's, that's, that's sort of how I go through it. it. Being able to tell the story verbally is a big part of it. Bullet point, write it out by hand. Uh, and then after, um, writing it out by hand, type it up as I'm typing it up, I change it while I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes I'll go back to writing it out by hand. I'll just have the screen up in front of me or my notes around me and I'll go through that and then type it up and then change it a bit until eventually it's ready. And, and getting feedback from people, uh, is also a big part of that. Yeah. One of the things that Dylan and I, uh, kind of struggled with in the, in earlier on when writing our stories was, uh, you know, having every story being told from a white dude point of view, uh, and then every character is just a white dude. Uh, so as we started like, you know, kind of involving ourselves in a process, like, okay, inclusivity is important to us. Uh, are there any tips that you have to making sure that not every character that you write has the same point of view? Uh, well, that's an interesting point, because uh, I think one thing would be to, if you're writing something, understand that, um, and I know you guys know this, uh, so I'm not, I'm not knocking your example here, but not every white guy has the same point of view, right? But not everybody realizes, like, to <laughs> think about that while they're writing. A lot of people, you are right, start writing from a point that either they experience or they have seen before because a lot of movies are copycat even without realizing it. And so one of the things that I uh, do, for instance, would be, um, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of like uh, check mark script writing. Uh, like for instance, the Bechdel test is actually a, a good writing prompt, all right? But when people go see a movie and they're like, does it do this? Does it do this? I'm like, well, this movie takes place in a prisoner of war camp in the Second World War with a bunch of British soldiers. So maybe not. <laughs> but um, it's uh, so but a lot of the time it's just what I um, try to tell people when they ask is. I'm working on a film right now that's dealing with a actor who is quadriplegic, all right? He's paralyzed from the shoulders down, all right? And he is, in fact, a white dude. But he also, um, like, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is the actor himself is paralyzed, not just the character. And he was one of the, and he's the guy who I wrote it with, okay? And originally, we weren't going to even have him play the main character. I mean, we were just writing it together, and I was going through like, okay, I'll do auditions. I know some actors who this, that, the other thing. And he had never acted before. And eventually I just kind of thought, hey man, do you think you can do this? And he said, I wasn't gonna say anything, but I think I can. And we did a screen test and he knocked it out of the park. I'm like, great, you're in the movie. Congratulations, you've been promoted. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, considering stuff like a lot of people, the reason why I'm bringing this up because it does speak to your question with perspectives is some people are worried about um, representing someone that they themselves don't represent or that they feel they don't know enough about, or they feel like, even if I try to do well, I'm going to get some blowback for this. If there's some little thing I don't get, or uh, with the case of actors who have a disability, some of them are like, well, how am I going to get them out to the location? And, what I've found with that kind of thing with specifically actors who have a disability in some way is that it's not, my experience has been is it's not going to be nearly as big of an issue as you think it's going to be, as you might think it's going to be. People with disabilities, a lot of them, they already are pretty good at figuring out how they are going to get somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, like they, they go out and it's uh, figuring out, like just calling ahead to a theater or, or wherever you happen to be filming 
like, hey, is this handicap accessible? Um, and figuring things out that way. But I mean, just having in the back of your mind, like, hey, is there any reason why this couldn't be a woman? Is there any reason, like, if if you haven't already started thinking that way, you know, it's like, or is there any reason why this person, like, would it would it make a difference if this person was Chinese versus if the character was Japanese? You know, what kind of dynamic is it there versus if they're like Filipino or something? And so, because sometimes it doesn't really make a difference at all. Right. You know, it's just like Marty McFly could have been played by, you know, a little Asian girl and the movie would have probably been fairly similar. OK, well, no, it wouldn't. Not with the whole scene with his mom at the end. Never mind. Terrible. <laughs> no. I was thinking of the beginning when they're like, oh, it's a time yeah. machine or something. But so horrible example. But actually, that leads into the next I like the next thing I was going to say. Not everything works for everything. <laughs> All right. And um so you should be mindful of if it's going to affect something. Uh, sometimes it's going to be a positive effect. My favorite example of that kind of casting was with Alien by Ridley Scott. Sigourney Weaver plays Ripley. Ripley was originally written to be a man. And then at some point, someone, I think it was Ridley Scott, said, why don't we just hire a, an actress? And ended up working out great and it's cool because Sigourney Weaver is amazing mm -hmm. but then they were able to continue that story with that character in the sequel Aliens and had it be a bit more about like okay so she was a mother and let's deal with the time frame there and motherhood is what Aliens in my opinion is the ultimate theme of that movie is like you've got the queen alien thing and all her children and you've got Sigourney Weaver Ripley, you know, with all of her. So I'd say, you know, consider possibilities like, Hey, if this character was in a wheelchair, would that make a difference? Okay. If it makes a difference, is it a good difference? Does it make things more difficult for them? Does that make it a obstacle that that character like has to contend with? So that's more difficult for them to defeat the bad guy. Does that create it to be more dramatic in some way or does you know if luke skywalker and princess leia were switched all right where it's a father and a daughter would that be different would it be would it like i don't know if it would be better or worse i don't know that off the top of my head i'm not sure you would have to change a whole lot about it but um it's you know just keeping those kinds of ideas open and in like, and keeping it practical in a way. Sometimes when it's practical, that means like, Hey, this is a prisoner of war camp in world war two. And uh, historically with this particular camp, most of the British troops were white, but even in that case, it's like, depending on the situation you might have, like India was part of the British Commonwealth at that time. So, if there should be some of those guys in there, then put them in there, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, and, but also with like things like fantasy and sci-fi, it depends on the rules of your universe entirely. Um, like with Lord of the Rings, Tolkien has everything, like the genealogy of absolutely everybody figured out. And it's even the Lord of the Rings is such a small part of his world. Yeah. That, like the Lord of the Rings, like that trilogy is like one of the smaller events that he wrote about, which is insane. And when you look over farther to the east, there are other men, and there are, and they are um, of different races. And in the Lord of the Rings, you hear mostly about some of them being bad guys. But even in that case, you have the moment where Faramir is looking at this one uh, guy from Harad, and who he's who's been killed, and he's like. I wonder what his name is. I wonder if he actually wanted to go on this quest. Was he tricked? Like, he's just a guy. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien wrote a little bit about how far off in the East there were all these other kingdoms and there were good, like these families that fought against the good and the evil and all that stuff. And then the bad ones ended up beating them out in that particular time frame, which is why they merged over with Mordor for that stint. So it's, uh, you know, like, but then you have some other things where it just doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, just go for it. Um, so just be mindful, figure out what you're going to do, uh, like what you want to accomplish. 
realized that no, not everything works with everything. Like, you know, if Marty McFly was played by a little girl, that probably wouldn't work, you know, <laughs> but um, if, uh, you know, but with Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker, maybe I'm forgetting something obvious here, but I like if they were switched, I mean, it might not be a huge, like it wouldn't be a huge, it wouldn't wreck your story, you know, and you might change a few lines, but it sure. might it'd be a different theme. So I'd say, you well, know, just think, ask yourself like, Hey, could I, if I did, what would be the problem or how would that be better? And just work it out. Well, touching on the Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker thing, though, uh, there is the idea of uh, representation. And, you know, my daughter is a 20 year old girl and it took her up till <laughs> Force Awakens to realize that a girl could be a Jedi. So even though uh, it might not have affected the story per se, it affects the world in, in a bit, because if every person that could be a white guy is a white guy just because they can be uh, a kind of you know, slows some progress down, don't you think? Well, I wouldn't agree with that with Star Wars because Mace Windu's uh, the highest humanoid on the Jedi Council and he's not a white dude and there's plenty of female Jedi. And in fact, the person who's in charge of the Jedi archives is a woman. And I don't believe she's a force user, but everybody acknowledges her contribution to everything. So I think Star Wars is already pretty good about that and it's also gotten better over like even just the jump of diversity between episode four and episode five just between those two movies was a massive jump particularly if you're looking at when they come came out but um you've got uh you know like lando calrissian in there as well and it's like but yeah there's i mean you know i it's it's possible that your daughter just didn't watch Star Wars very closely because there are female Jedi in the Star Wars universe. And some of them are the little kids that Anakin, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so, I mean, that's, and another thing with that is just, um, like I can appreciate how, what it means to a young girl to see the main character with the lightsaber being like, oh, she's like me, you know, like I'm, I'm not knocking that kind of thing at all. I don't, I'm not like race sucks or anything like that, you know? Um, but it's, uh, I think some people get a little uh, trigger happy with saying there's something wrong with the movie with some of the representation, like not always, but my example with that would be when I was in college, there was someone who said Aladdin was a bad movie because only the bad guys in it have beards. And that's something that like Middle Eastern people have. And it's like this bad stereotype. And I'm like, well, the genie and the Sultan have beards. So no, you're just wrong. Like Aladdin's a kid. Sure. He doesn't have a beard, but I think you're kind of making up a problem with that. So representation is not a, um, I think representation is an import is an important thing in film, uh, but it also like depends on what kind of movie you're making. And it's like the the way that I kind of try to uh, the way that I deal with it because I think like probably half of the films I've made I have a female lead in them, including Jess Paul, you know, for a funny man. But um, it's like if the way that I kind of try to write stuff, and this is me, not everybody, but I like it when there's a, a message in the story, but I do not like having a message that has a story in it. It's like, make the story first, and your story might star Sigourney Weaver, and you might set out to do something like that on purpose, all right, you know, um, as like Black Panther was a character for a long time, but that movie obviously had a lot of impact, even though there were other black superheroes before that for many, many years. Uh, but that was like, oh, it's the MCU and like, I mean, Falcon had been around too, but that was still like a, a big important thing for a lot of people. And I, I don't think, I think a lot of people knock that, you know, it'd be like, oh, well, why doesn't he just, why, why doesn't your kid just like this other guy? And it's like, well, he probably does, but it's, it's really, there's something special about seeing, feeling validated. Like, Hey, when I become 
one of the adults who's supposed to run things because I'm a kid, I can't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, but when I become an adult who's running something, what is that going to look like? And oh, maybe there I am. And you should be able to identify with a character who's not part of your demographic, right? All right. My, like, in my favorite Miyazaki movie is Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. And it's because of the main character. It's like, I identify with her. We're not the same sex. That doesn't mean we've got nothing in common or that there aren't things about her that I wish I was more like, or there's things that she believes that I don't think I really believe, but I wish were true. And I want to believe, you know, just like about how she thinks the way the world works. And like, it's, I could go into that movie later, but it's, um, so, uh, yeah, I think when you're, I, I think a lot of people don't think about representation enough when they're writing. I think it's like 25% of Americans have a disability and that's certainly not reflected in movies at all. <laughs> and uh, although once again, sci-fi coming in clutch with the X-Men, you've got like, <laughs> this one's blind, this one's in a wheelchair, this one can't hear, this one's this, you know, um, which is, you know, <laughs> pretty awesome. But it's, uh, yeah, it, it depends on what you're trying to do and what your movie's for and making it, I think my experience is that most honest people are all right with your movie making sense in some way. There are exceptions to that with some people who get really trigger happy about like, ah, there's a, a, a something that isn't me. That's the main character. And they freak out when they're not thinking about it enough. They've conditioned themselves into reacting negatively about that kind of thing. And that's wrong. They should be objective and calm down a little bit, I think. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, that, that's sort of my thoughts on that kind of deal. So, I but I certainly have no, uh, qualms with having representation in my films, but it's also like, it depends on the situation. And I do think about that kind of thing and I try to be tactful about it. And, there's some ways that, you know, sometimes it's supposed to serve the story. Like the example I gave of, oh, this person's in a wheelchair. Does that make it like more difficult for them to overcome something as an example? And sometimes it shouldn't necessarily <laughs> contribute to the story. It should just be like, it's a given. One of the things that I personally roll my eyes at is when there's a strong female character who goes and does something and then everyone online did you notice she's a woman i'm like yes i did but when i was watching star wars as a kid and princess leia was blowing stormtroopers away down that hall like someone has to save our skins ah, you know i wasn't like oh i can't believe that this, this, no one had to tell me that i just saw it it was a given and so it, it and you know it's i'm just gonna revert back to what I said before. It depends on the project because yeah, okay, sometimes highlighting something like that can be a good thing. But I think following falling into just like a regular pattern on how you react to stuff makes you sloppy and that can turn you into someone who's the kind of person who either has a problem with Aladdin or has a problem with, ah, the, why is the main character a woman? You know, it's like, well, there's actually, it makes sense. Why is that a problem? So I think, just be mentally awake about it, pay attention, and don't get to don't don't get into a habit <laughs> would be my main thing on that. I think I think the main point that everybody tends to circles down to is that it relies on authenticity. You want to avoid being token about it. So mm -hmm. you don't want to just like, yeah, hey, we got one person who's not white here. And you want to you want to make it feel like it's authentic and sincere and not just a cynical kind of yeah. inclusionary effort. Um, and the reason why I think if I could say, I know I just yeah, go for it. Off, to build off your idea there. The reason why that's true is because that doesn't just apply to diversity. Um, authenticity. It's like, how do you have authenticity in a, you know, a, a super over the top movie? You know, it's like, well, one way is, Hey, the way that these characters feel about each other is realistic. Like, okay star wars it's it's totally crazy there's all there's magic and stuff but when han solo and princess leia are alone together and they're falling in love 
it's it feels real. It feels like they have real chemistry. It's all pretend. None of it's real. It's not even <laughs> moving. They're just still images with a shutter. Nothing. It's all fake. It's all fake. But having authenticity in it is um part of it but then also having the escapism for man i wish i could jump as high as a jedi or i wish i like if i was in a pod race i bet i'd win you know kind of a thing so but yeah i think it it, it gets down mostly to authenticity but it depends on the project because like i mean hamilton i don't think anybody complained about that it's a great musical i love it i have like half of it memorized at least and it's like ah oh, george washington's black i'm like i don't care like i, I get it it's art and I, I see what you're doing with it, and it's brilliant. There's nothing wrong with doing a production of a Shakespeare play where, like, either the races or the genders are reversed or mishmashed or whatever. Like, mess with it, play with it, see what happens. And you'll get, and that's really common in Shakespeare productions. And it's like, I have found most of the time the results of that are really interesting. And like, they help, like, the, it, the story is still powerful, but it helps you to think about it in a new way and, and it's enriching. And as long as the production's good, <laughs> you know, at the end of it, it's like, at the end of the day, make a good movie. I don't care what you're supporting. It's like, you could be supporting my religion. And if it's a terrible movie, I'm not going to give you pity dollars when to go see it. It's like, it's like make a good movie first and then we can talk about what you think. So that's, yeah. that's my thought on it. No, and we could obviously talk to you all day about anything filmmaking, uh, but we did want to talk about your podcast real fast before we get on to uh, what our show does. Uh, now, Peter presents uh, Homer's Iliad. What is it about Homer's Iliad that like is just too, too much for you to keep to yourself? <laughs> okay, it's just the coolest book ever, man. <laughs> like, it's, got, it's got everything in it and it works. It's the foundation of Western literature it is the ancient world MCU. It has every, like, it has the length and breadth, width, whatever, of humanity. It's funny. It's scary. It's got crazy action. It's disturbing. It's got, it's got a, like, a ninja night raid in it. It's got battles. It's got races. It's got, um, like it's got love, like <laughs> true love miracles, you know, it's like the princess, the opening line in the princess bride, like when he's like, are there any sports in it? Are you kidding? Fencing, <laughs> sword fighting, <laughs> revenge, escape, you know, it's got everything like that. And it's awesome. <laughs> and my favorite translation is by Stanley Lombardo. And uh, because Iliad is in the public domain, right? It ought to be after all these years, but not every translation is in the public mm -hmm. domain. People got to, you know, get paid for that work. But I, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I reached out to Stanley Lombardo, who, who translated the copy that I have and is my favorite one because I used to work in a library and I'd sneak over to the shelf with Iliad and go through like the different versions. I'd be like, oh, that's pretty good. Ah, is, you know. <laughs> anyway, total nerd for this book. I love it. <laughs> and it's, but I reached out to him and it was hard to find him because I think he's like, he became a Zen master and he's got this whole other hmm. thing going on now. But I reached out to him and he called me back and, uh, and he talked to me about what I wanted to do. And um, he talked to the publisher and he said, go for it. You know? And so I was like, thank you, sir. I, this is awesome. <laughs> and uh, it was so cool. I got to like talk to one of my heroes on the phone in the pandemic. That was a highlight for me. And, but the, my podcast, uh, it's, it's this YouTube video series. It's not just an audio book. All right. It's in fact, it's, it's not an audio book. I do read the book. And it's a dramatic reading. It's out loud. It's all that. I do different voices for the characters, which is hilarious. And the, uh, but I, after the chapter, it, it, well, it's divided up into 24 books. All right. We might call them chapters, but they were called books back then because uh, an entire scroll was called a book. It was divided into 24 scrolls by the librarians at the library of Alexandria, which burned down tragically. But yeah, that's, that's kind of tells you the reason why we have Iliad like to not just say like oh i like it but the chief librarian 
at the, the first chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria made it his personal project to compile Iliad and standardize the text. And that work was carried on by the third um, uh, director of the library as well. A large portion of the books in the Library of Alexandria were commentaries on Iliad. It's impossible to overstate how important this book was. It was like the closest thing their culture had to like a Bible uh, until the Bible came out in Europe. <laughs> like, you know, came out, whatever. But the, um, the like, when that, release, that, when, the release when was that, pretty cool. Like, First yeah, published in 250. But like, but until that, like, you know, hugely affected uh, the culture of the West, the Iliad was such a big part of that. Alexander the Great had a copy of it that he carried with him on campaigns that he kept in a golden box. And then at night he would sleep with a knife under his pillow and the latest book of Iliad that he was on that he was reading. He wanted to be like Achilles, which I think means he totally lost the point of the book. But um, <laughs> it's, it's such a interesting living. It's still like, you might think like, oh, back then, did they know how to like really compile a story well? Could they keep it tight? You know, all that's like, yes, it's great. It's amazing. It still holds up. People haven't changed since then. It's like, it's got the same people. And there's so many scenes in it that are exactly like scenes that you see in any movie, like the pep up talk before a battle. Okay. And even the format of how that goes is in Iliad and the, the conflict between the people and the thing that also keeps it, uh, the, the thing that makes it really special to me is that throughout the entire book, there's this balancing act with themes. One is Glor is that war is glorious and awesome and action is fun and it kicks ass. You know? <laughs> like this is the coolest, awesomest thing. Like, oh, and he looked fantastic while he was doing it. And he said something really cool. And then on the other side of it, we have the dark tragedy side of war where you'll have this one guy who's like, oh, he's fighting the enemy. He kills this other guy. But then suddenly in the book, it'll say, all right, this guy, his name was you know, Jonathan, and he had just gotten married, but before he got to go on his honeymoon, he was called to fight for Troy. And he had done all this stuff, like he had fallen in love, he had done all this stuff to get married. And then he left and like his girlfriend gave him a kiss on the cheek and like his mom helped like make some of his armor and his dad gave him his old sword and all this stuff. And he has like a brother and three sisters and all this stuff. And his home is over in this place that people would know. It would be like, hey, he's got a house in Jersey. All right. And then it says, and then it'll be like, and he just died. And this guy, he's <laughs> like, I'm fantastic. Doesn't, doesn't know all that. He doesn't know this guy's name. And then he's just like defiling his body. He's taking the armor off and he's take, and he throws it in his tent and forgets all about that dude. These two ideas that we see in film all the time, where you've got the saving private Ryan, things are awful and terrible. And then you've got the, fun action, like, yeah, charge in, let's get the baddies, you know, fighting and fighting and fighting until finally those two themes come head to head toward the end of the book. And it tells you whether this one, that one, or both are true in some way. And that is, and the ultimate theme of it is something that I find um, I, I find that almost nobody knows anything about this book. If you told me like, oh, this is what the story is about, you'd probably be wrong, all right? Even with the way it ends, the ending isn't what most people think it is. Like the famous, this is what happens. It doesn't, <laughs> like, it's totally different. It's like the biggest kept secret in the world. You gotta check it out. So um, I'm like obviously giddy about this whole thing. I love it, but it speaks to me on a very deep level. And something that I've heard veterans say about Homer with Iliad and Odyssey is that he gets it, all right? Well, we were talking about understanding something you haven't gone through before as like a filmmaker or an author. Homer might have been a veteran, we don't know. That's one of the things I talk about in my podcast because I do an analysis and commentary after the book. And I say, this is a lot of stuff for someone to just come up with. And what we know about Bronze Age warfare, this is what happens when you hit somebody there with a the sword, their eyes pop out. You wouldn't think of that, but that's what happens. <laughs> you know, all this is like, he probably saw that or heard about it. And there's all these 
um, metaphors he uses from nature with lions. It's like he probably spent a lot of time outside. But the other thing we hear about Homer is that he might have been blind. Hmm. So how does he get all that image <laughs> in there? Maybe he wasn't born hmm. blind. Maybe he just listened really well because I personally believe that like, I, I mean, I have my theories is like, he could have been a veteran. He could have been born with sight and eventually become blind and then became Homer. Uh, but it's also possible that he was born blind and just gathered all these stories and all these things and came up with this. And there is like archeological proof that there was some kind of battle that happened at Troy around the time that we believe this happened. Um, and so legends could have come out of that. But I believe that if you're, um, you, you should be able to speak with your own artistic voice, but you ought to be able to authentically sort of, um, with, like use someone else's voice or like to speak, how, how you say it, represent someone completely outside yourself. All right. Steven Spielberg has never been in, in battle, but every single person who is on Omaha beach, who saw saving private Ryan said he nailed it. How did he do that? Well, with film, big misconception. You don't have to experience something. You don't have to experience something in order to depict it. It can help, uh, but ultimately it gets down to do your research, I believe. So uh, I'm like, I cannot tell people enough, like you got to check out this book. It's insane, but a lot of people have a hard time reading it. The language sounds very high up there and people don't always think, when, when people are reading old texts, you know, they don't always think, wait, is this guy being sarcastic? Is this guy angry? Like they don't necessarily get the subtext of it. They think everybody's saying exactly what they mean. And that's part of what I go into is like, no, 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 no. This guy hates this guy. <laughs> you know, and so when he says like, oh man, you're just so interesting all the time. You know, he's really just like you, man, you know, so, um, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's an electrifying epic poem that, still, I believe, has vivid power that is that can easily be felt today, which that like we've we've been imitating this book for thousands of years. And yeah, we've sometimes we've done what it's done very well. And but I think most of this time this book kind of, you know, still has taken first place. It does for me. It is it is my favorite book that I have and specifically Stanley Lombardo's translation. So that's, but if you want to learn more about it, check out <laughs> Peter Presents on yeah. YouTube and uh, there's 24 hours of content. Don't be, uh, you know, intimidated by that. If by the end of episode zero, not episode one, episode zero, if you don't like it, I'll save you some time. Don't watch the rest of it. It doesn't <laughs> It's, All right. you're, it's not suddenly going to change a whole lot. All right. It gets better. But if you don't like it by the like halfway point of episode zero, it's, it's not for you. Uh, but I, I've, I've been really surprised how well people have reacted to it. Uh, I had a consistent live audience that would, cause these were live streams originally and I had a consistent audience and now a bunch of students found the channel. They use it to study for liter literature and mythology courses and people will comment and be like, oh my gosh, you totally saved my life with this. I'm like, ah, chapter two due tomorrow. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's my long passionate answer to your question. So. No, I love it. Yeah. Please <laughs> go, go check out Peter presents home resilient. We will actually put a link to his channel in the show notes here. So if you're uh, watching or listening to this, uh, you can just click the little, uh, I guess, blue uh, underlined icon thing, and then that'll take you right yeah. over to Peter's page. Uh, but Mr. Regan, we got to uh, get on to <laughs> what we do in the show. And I'm sorry for taking up a lot of your time. We could talk to you forever. You are you're aggressively interested. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I, didn't let, <laughs> uh, I didn't let Dylan ask any questions whatsoever. I ask questions. <laughs> All right, that's fair. Uh, okay, so here's what we do with this part of the show. Uh, well, I used to have Dylan come over to my apartment and I would throw a whole bunch of ideas at him and he would sometimes leave. Uh, sometimes he would not answer at all and we would just fight over which ones to work on. So that's why we asked our guests to pick 
pick the one that we do. So we're going to both uh, pitch an idea to you, and you're going to let us know which one we should work on. Uh, right. Now, the, the one that has uh, not been chosen recently, because for whatever reason, and I'm going to keep pitching it because I think there's a story in here somewhere. Oh. Uh, okay. So I had this idea of like a like a Jane Goodall character, someone who lives in the wild and really just loves animals and nature uh, through researching, uh, you know, new area. They find an animal that builds his own, builds their own house and has a social structure. And we realized that this animal actually uh, is evolving to be uh, a danger to humanity. They can actually like fight humans. Um, initially, I had the idea that an alien race came and forced evolution on an animal. Uh, but because people keep saying no to this idea, I'm going to change it up a little bit and now say this is going to be uh, <laughs> the the hidden reveal at the end is that uh, aliens <laughs> maybe out of boredom just forced it. So anyway, I have this idea of, uh, of an evolved other species that will make humans no longer the top species on the planet. All right. <sighs> yeah, what a terrible. I, I'm. No, it's not. <laughs> no, no, it's. I'm. I'm. I'm already. The gears are turning. So I'm. I'm actually. I'm considering this one. Actually, yeah. I'm already like. All right. No, I'm. I'm not being. I'm. I'm not that. Don't. Nice. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't need that. Uh, people, some people are like. You're nice. I'm like. I don't know, man. No. no. Like, if I don't like your ideas. Sometimes I'll be like. Well, that's interesting. But, well, my my thing. Know, my thing is. I, no, I can think of a bunch of things to do with that right now. Yeah, and and yeah. earlier you mentioned that it's about the heart of the story and not just mm -hmm. the concept of the story. And what I think that I'm getting to is that uh, humans are so arrogant on this planet and we really don't have anything to fight except for sharks. Uh, and that's obviously uh, on their, their own ground. So I think there needs to be yeah. a story where humans uh, need to be scared of something somewhere. Right. And that's kind of what I want to get to, but anyway, whatever. Right. Dylan, go ahead. You jerk. Right. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, mine is not quite so heady as Zach's. Sure. Um, a bunch of a, a group of people wake up on a train with no memory of how they got there. There's a, like a car on either end. They're just going through the countryside, and then a voice comes over and it says, "Whoever can hold the engine room for sixty minutes will be granted a, a ludicrous sum of money." Uh, there are weapons in the compartments above you. Battle train go. I'm gonna call it battle train. That's it. Like I said, I I I, I went really pulpy this week. Um, right. Which when I, I was just pitch, oh, I was just pitching it right now, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of Snowpiercer. But, I was about to say, I'm like, hey, yeah, you um, it's, it's I Snowpiercer have Snowpiercer without a story. It's but Snowpiercer listen. without the interesting setting. <laughs> <laughs> I watched a lot of like Indonesian and like Philippine like action movies this week where it's just like fight no, scenes and I'm like is, what's a good is, location for a fight scene? It's a train. No, this is that movie Belko. That's it. Bel That's, I haven't seen it. No, no. <laughs> Get, give me a give me another idea. <laughs> okay, well Battle Train. Uh, All right. So first let me say about Battle Train. Um I would if you have the motivation for them be money, I, I I'd suggest one of a couple things. One is say, and whoever doesn't hold the engine dies, you know, or something like the the track, the cart's gonna blow up in it's thirty implied. minutes or whatever. <laughs> Put a ticking time bomb involved yeah. there, but um, like and and we, if you're gonna have the motivation be money uh, or survival, then the way you could get a heart to that story is by thing like, okay, what do people want money for? You can have the kind of the jerk who's like, I just want to be wealthy. <laughs> I'll kill them, whatever. <laughs> and then you might have someone who's like, oh my gosh, my, uh, you know, little sister was in a car accident and I need yeah. to buy her some new bones with a hundred dollars <laughs> and that'll be her thing. <laughs> uh, so you can kind of get that. And then maybe some people <laughs> team up and they'll, you know, start like, and then they have to fight each other and there can only be one. But um, I think I'm going to go with Zach's idea on this one. Oh, um, Dylan. Dylan, this is a script and you should check it out <laughs> because even though, even though it's like, Oh, well, it's like snow piercer. Well, I look as, I try to write original stuff and make original films, I guess, but I think a lot of people are way too hung up on 
doing something nobody else has done before when Guardians of the Galaxy came out and there was a talking tree person. People didn't go, hey, that's Treebeard. What are they doing with that? You know, like they didn't they didn't get mad at Groot. They just liked Groot because they liked his character. You got a giant wall in like half a dozen things. You got Game of Thrones, they got a giant wall. Film of mm -hmm. Alchemist, they got a giant wall. Hadrian, he's got a giant wall. China, they've got a giant wall. Shadow Trump and bone. Trying to make yeah. a giant wall. It's like, it's a real thing. So it's authentic. You can get away with it. And people killing each other for money happens in real life. So, and hey, trains are real too. But uh, yeah, I think you could pursue something with that. Don't worry about it being a little bit like Snowpiercer because ultimately, even like, if, if people were worried about that, they just wouldn't remake movies, you know? So um, I think you can have, as long as the heart of your story is a little different than um, what it is in Snowpiercer, then you could be like proud to say like, no, yeah, I made this. And you could even pitch it by saying like, it's like Snowpiercer, but it's crossed with Battle Royale or something like that. Um, you could do that, but I'm going to go with Zach on this one. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so do we just start on that? Or do you want to take us away a little more, or what do you think? Yeah, well, first, I just want to... Uh, I want to virtually slap Dylan in the face. Uh, okay, number one, I think you threw a layup so that this story gets uh, taken. <laughs> and I think that, A, you're a good friend. I appreciate it. But, B, don't like it. Don't like that. You you bring better stuff. <laughs> I respect you too much to sandbag you. <laughs> And this idea has been sitting on our document for months. And Battle I have been Frank? thinking, my, yes, I can show you where it is. I will go highlight it right now because we're both on the document. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. It's anyway. Uh, title, Battle Train. It's like, that's all you need to know. Choo -choo, Bobby, let's go. We got Battle Trains. I got post-apocalyptic truckers. I got demon engines. Like, I got a bunch of stuff that Zach's like, come up with a story for it. I'm like, There's I did. No story. No, you you, yeah, I appreciate you. You're a very good friend. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, okay, so we're going to go. This. My, we're going to go with my story this time, uh, which is the idea that some species uh, has been uh, uplifted to, uh, I guess, be a predatory level of uh, over a human. Now, I don't really have a story with this, and I, I really just wanted to find out what would happen if uh, an. A <laughs> Originally, what would happen if an alien came here and just said, you know, humans kind of suck. Uh, they need something to play with. So uh, at first it was they came and they chose some species to force evolution. Uh, and it was originally it was an arthropod. Then it turned into uh, a crocodile. Then it went into a platypus. Uh, then it turned into that it wasn't aliens at all. But anyway, um, so we do like the idea of coming across a species that is uh, aggressively evolved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, they would need to be a land species just because uh, obviously we, we can die in the water and whatever. So let's make them a land species. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Regan, do you think that there is a species that would be uh, exciting or even cool to forcibly evolve to make them hunt humans? Uh, yeah, well, there's already one that's kind of out there. Um, I don't know if, uh, so I'm originally from Texas, so I don't know if you know what the wild hog issue is down there. Yeah. It's <laughs> bananas. They are monsters and we have to kill them. Um, there's, uh, there was a woman in, uh, I think it was Houston, who was killed by a bunch of these. They will eat everything and we are on that list. Now, of course, they're not as evolved, but guess what? They're already really smart, okay? Like, hogs can play games, yeah. like video games. Like, they're, they're almost like ravens, okay? It's like we kind of haven't figured out entirely how smart they are yet because we keep running out of tests and they keep passing them. <laughs> And they wreck the ecosystem. They absolutely, they, they'll eat your dog, they'll eat your cat, they'll eat your kid. <laughs> And there, and there's tons of them. Like you have to kill 80% of them every year or else the population will increase. And guess what? Haven't been able to do that. There's like 3 million of them or 30 million. There's tons of them. They're, they're crazy. This, I don't know if you've heard about this. This is a totally real thing. You won't believe it. And they're scary. Like they've got these like, okay. So when I was a kid, like I'll finish up my why it should be hogs pitch with this. Okay. We know some people 
uh, a guy who was in a Boy Scout troop. And when he was a kid, they were doing like horseback riding, you know, like on a, they were, you've seen Indiana Jones in the last crusade where they're like riding out somewhere. They were doing that. Okay. And he looks over and a hog runs up under somebody's horse and with its tusks just slashed up under the horse and Ooh. disemboweled it instantly. Okay. It killed the horse. All right, these things are monsters, and if you look up how big these things can get, like I, I know people who hunt these things. All right, and by the way, they're such a problem that technically they are uh, classified as a pest in Texas, which means you don't need a license to kill these things. It's like killing a mouse. You don't have to ask anybody, just go out, find them, get them. And uh, <laughs> it's like, cause we need to. And you might think, oh, we get bacon out of that. Guess what? They don't even taste that great. That's the other problem. Cause they're just like, got all, like you have to cook the living daylights out of them. They're full of parasites. So it's not even like, oh great, giant food supply. Let's deal with it. It's like, no, if you want to eat them, it's a much longer process, whatever. So, yeah, hogs are monsters. We should kill them. But <laughs> if they were slightly more evolved, because they, they can plan. They're like velociraptors. I'm kind of like making this funny to introduce it, but it's like they will figure stuff out. They can escape from the places that they're kept sometimes. They'll kind of keep track of what's going on. They're actually, as far as most of the other animals we share this planet with go, they're pretty smart and they're clever and uh, and they're dangerous. So just a little push from something to make it like, just make them a little bit more identifiable for us like um, would be what would make it more interesting. My other... Uh, <laughs> option was going to be ants because the weight of ants on the planet is equal to the weight of humans on the mm -hmm. planet and the things that those things can do are insane so i'm glad that the ones i live with aren't after me but we, we did yeah. a smart ant story a few, a few weeks <laughs> yeah. ago actually yeah <laughs> that was a good yeah. one so, uh, but yeah, I'd say either bugs like that because yeah. everybody hates those or wild yeah. hogs but just push them a little bit no, I like the hog. I like the hog thing, uh, and I think that we could just give them thumbs, and that would really just make them the most terrifying things on the actual planet. All they need. So okay, so uh, we have uh, someone who is uh, foraging or or wandering around the wilderness looking for new species, and comes across this uh, tiny uh, tribe of hogs that has thumbs. They have built themselves houses. Uh, they wear clothes, maybe, or something, or just something to cover up because they've seen humans. I don't know. I, I like them being slightly further along so that we look at them in sheer terror. Um, now, yeah. here, here's a couple of quick questions for you, Peter. When you're writing uh, a story, how important is it to give that window character uh, to your to your story? If, if it is a bit of a farcical tale, do you always have to give the audience somebody to kind of like latch on to so they know the rules quickly or do you or do you not really dumb down to your audience it depends on the project sometimes that well the answer would be sometimes yes i do that um there's a, a historical film i want to do at some point about a brit like a, a guy from the what we call the british isles now who gets kidnapped by the Romans for this whole thing and ends up working behind the scenes at the Colosseum through a series of weird events. And we sort of identify with him looking at this insane culture of people who watch people get executed once a week, you know, for fun and pay to see it and like it. And he's just like, what are you, you guys are insane. But then the other joke is like, his people are headhunters, so you know it's like um, they're, they're like you guys are crazy. Like you guys are crazy. We don't do it for fun, and they're like, "Tell me it wasn't fun." And, uh, but anyway, so sometimes, yeah, I think that would be good for this one. The other option, uh, and since we're like talking about pigs here, haha, pigs are funny. This could come off as sounding really funny, the whole thing. But if you did it right, like you just just frame it the right way, and all you see are orcs. Okay, <laughs> you know, like they're just <laughs> that, that is what it sounds like. Also yeah, have it be. Um, you could also have. Oh. I I would either do what you're saying here with have the main character be the guy who finds them or gal, whatever it ends up being, and um, they uh, or have the pigs themselves, the hogs, be the main characters who are sort of looking at this from another perspective and maybe the same way that 
the human characters look at the Titans and attack on Titan. And like these things are still more advanced than us or like still stronger, better, faster, whatever. Like how do we even deal with this? And they're just doing everything they can to survive. Like maybe they're not, cause maybe the thing is they're smart enough that, you know, trying to achieve conquest on planet earth isn't going to succeed. And maybe they don't want to do that. Maybe we make them, maybe the thing that makes it like, okay, you got two options for this movie, man. <laughs> One, it's the kill the pigs movie. And it's like starship troopers oh, without God. the nuance to it at all. <laughs> you know, without the subtext of, are we the bad guys here? You know, like just have it be kill them. They're evil. They, they ate my mom and they almost die. Like the only good, pig is a dead pig so let's make these pigs good ah, you know <laughs> have the old guy come out with like a world war ii rifle and he's like it's been a while you know and he's just mowing them down with a bolt action and then they he lets the younger kids escape and he dies and they're like we'll do it for gramps you know that could be the movie or you have the movie that is smart um <laughs> and where which you could do with this which because you could still have action beats in it but if you have it sort of this thing where, okay, we're dealing with some other people on this planet now. Maybe there's something about them that we have a history of, hey, we eat these things all the time. And they're pests. We don't like them. And they are dangerous. But now they're starting to come into their own what do we do about that? And there could be some people who say, well, we can't just kill them. And then some people are like, well, do we just put them all in a camp? And like, you know, and <laughs> then you've got some people who are like, no, they stink and I don't like them. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna go with like, if from a certain point of view, the hogs in this film could be like, the Native Americans and the Europeans show up and maybe the hogs realize they're smart enough to realize they're getting smarter. And so they've hidden themselves. And so they've got this whole thing going on, this like th their own little corner of the world deep in the Congo where the dinosaur is. And then they've got, <laughs> or wherever, uh, and next to Bigfoot and they have, um, but then someone shows up and it's just like, oh no, what are we gonna do? Cause everybody know. maybe you, you start, you go around the village at first and you hear like, oh, here's their way of life. You know, it's like the beginning of Pocahontas or Moana, whatever, <laughs> they're doing their thing. And then they see something show up and it's like, and you hear like the, the, the stories they're told and like, and remember if you ever see one of the two legged things, those are evil demons that will eat you. And they have stories <laughs> of the demon that like, they like made entire cities to kill and eat us and yada, yada. It's never enough. And then they can't even just eat us one. Like we eat things one way. They eat us in every way they can think of, which is like, Hey, ham, bacon, whatever, you know, it's like all that, which is kind of funny, but if you think about it from the animal's perspective, this is messed up. And yeah. I do like, like the like, idea of them calling humans long pigs. Long yeah. pigs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, if it's like they eat us for fun kind of a thing. And then imagine, you know, your piglet running around with your buddy and then you're on the edge of the field and you just see one of these things you've never seen before, but maybe it doesn't look like the illustration. Maybe they have art. Okay. That could be a thing as well. Like that kind of would separate them from all the other animals is they do art. An elephant can you know, a monkey or an elephant can like smack paint on a canvas. I'm not sure it totally understands what it's doing, except peanut, get a peanut for that. You know, elephants are smart, but you know, I don't know. And, uh, but then they see this thing and maybe he's, maybe here's a twist. What if that guy's a vegetarian? What if he doesn't eat anything? Okay. And, um, and so at first they're like freaking out about him and then maybe he's like no no it's okay it's all right and they obviously don't speak the same language they start to interact maybe it's a kid who's not doing what their parents told them to but they're like well he seems okay and then they start to have <laughs> an interaction maybe he like feeds it something he's like hey i've got a candy bar or whatever and they've never had chocolate and they try that and they're like whoa <laughs> this guy has to be good and then they you get this sort of you know the edge of two worlds meeting a bit 
but then there's the inevitable problem, which is uh, a lot of people seem, a lot of people think that the big problems we have in the world are because someone's being dumb. And it's like, no, the big problems that happen in the world, most of the time I have found are because they are difficult, complicated, and there is not a simple solution that just a smart person could come up with and only a dumb person couldn't figure out. And uh, so it's like, all right, we're dealing with two different species here is, these ones eat and these one the humans are afraid oh my gosh these things are gonna take us over because hogs do all this stuff maybe we get some of the hog hunting culture in there whatever but on the flip side they're thinking hang on you've killed billions of us yeah. and but the one thing they all can agree is we don't get along <laughs> like we we all we know is we 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 have one use for each other and the other one doesn't like it um <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that a lot. I was uh, I, I was kind of having the idea earlier when you said that they, that they meet a human that it was like a child that was that wandered off earlier on, and then the pig people kind of take it as like a oh. pet and harvest it the way that we would harvest like a pig, so that when the people come across this village, they go, "Oh my God, they have like they have humans as pets. Like what yeah, is like happening?" A feral child, yeah. Yeah, oh I thought God. that. Yeah, that'd be kind of weird. Yeah. Now, when when coming up with a story, I'm not sure if you if if the the way your brain works, the way mine is, which is uh, I think humans uh, or whatever, you have a weird idea and then you write it down in your book. Um, now, when you start writing your story out, do do you try to make sure that you hit different plot points, or do you try to make sure that you're writing of the three arc structure, or do you try to just get just a loose idea of what the story is before you start really honing it in? Uh, I try to consider the possibilities of the story. Like what would be the strongest uh, template? I, I, I do think like, you know, the hero's journey or three act structure, those things work great most of the time. Uh, if you're doing something where it's supposed to be just a slice of life, then all you really should be focusing the most on is character scenes that don't have to go anywhere, but kind of let you know more about what this part of the world is like. This seems to me like a movie where you could do it as a, a one-off film where it's it's a three-act structure. It's like, hey, the hogs are, they, they're advanced. We see something happen. A ship comes down, you know, and then the thumb comes out in like this scary scene. That's the hook, you know, and then we meet our human character. He comes in. Maybe we're seeing most of the story through his eyes. Uh, maybe we almost get a dances with wolves kind of angle on it. <laughs> and, um, you know, you know, he ends up being like it just uh, the Jane Goodall says like it just amazes me how much like these pigs we are, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> and uh, then, but and like maybe he thinks, oh, we're gonna this is the biggest discovery ever, and then it ends up going awry. Maybe he still is a good guy, but because of his actions one thing leads to another and the villains start showing up and or the people who maybe aren't straight out villains but are afraid of what really could happen here um it's like if the like i think the main thing would be figuring out at what point are the hogs a viable threat and if part of it was something like maybe what if the because I like I actually like the aliens idea, even though I don't apply that very much to history. Where we're about, how did people make the pyramids? I'm like, people were smart, that's how yeah. they did it. Yeah. Yes, I mean, can I prove it? No, <laughs> but <laughs> there's, yeah, no. Um, there, there is someone, yeah, anyway. But the um, so but if you had all right, so what if we added a, a small element that could make because if it's just like a small village, then no one's gonna be like, they're gonna kill all of us. They'd just be like, that's weird and cool or whatever, maybe they die. But if, as far as a threat goes, what if it, and this could be part of the message of the film, like you could put it in there. What if the alien that imparts the intelligence like gives the thumb or whatever to the, <laughs> gives them the thumb, that's <laughs> uh, You know, what if they only give that to one animal? like not a speech, just one hog. And then that one is not just given the gift of the thumb, but also has the ability to give it to others of its kind. And then you can play with the idea of education, spreading knowledge, you know, like how ideas or uh, you know anything can catch on because 
there's a lot of hogs out there. And then <laughs> you've got your main character hog. Oh God. And like, and then the weird thing is when you know, when you know they're really sentient is when they don't all act the same. Uh, and my, that's part of it anyway, where it's like, okay, maybe this is a hog who's like, oh, I'm just going to make the world more awesome. I'm going to make more intelligent things like me. Ah, it's the garden of Eden. I'm going to make things in my image, whatever. But then some of the things that he creates end up being, you know, bad guys, you know, or like they they see what happens to pigs. Like they, like maybe this guy goes into a farm. Maybe he's already in a farm. That's where he came from. All right. And he like, it's sort of a secret of Nim thing where he becomes intelligent and escapes from the slaughterhouse and remembers this. And then at some point goes back and frees some other ones. Maybe they grow, they get really big so they can like really eat you know, a lot more, even though they can still get huge. You should look these things up. It's <laughs> yeah. terrifying. 300 but, pounds is what I saw. Yeah. yeah I'm scared. Bananas. So if you have, um, if you have it be like this thing that they can spread and then it spreads to some who are re like, maybe he's like, okay, we got to hide away and do our own thing. But then some get the thumb and remember where they came from or learn where they came from eventually. And they want revenge or they're like, they're going to find us and they're going to kill us. Do you know what they're doing to us? We have to bring all of us up, you know, and then you've got, different factions in there this could turn into an epic now it's like we got, um, you know it's, war for the planet of the hogs war yeah. For the planet of the hogs. yeah exactly exactly same yeah it's the same thing it's kind of like planet of the apes um but the um or you know you could take a similar idea with uh, idea with zombies okay um but yeah if you do it with uh hogs then um just give them thumbs and you have, and they have their personality. It's just when the two peoples meet, you know, it's also a case of like, hey, who struck first? You know, like if they kidnap the one kid, then that could be seen as a few different ways. Mm -hmm. Maybe that kid's parents died in a fire or something, and then they wandered off into the jungle somewhere, and then we're saved. And maybe people don't understand that. Maybe it was something else where, hey, maybe the hogs rode in, did a raid, killed some people, and took some slaves. Like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, people have done that. Yeah. So it's, um, I mean, yeah, I don't know why people passed up on this idea because I think there's so many things you could do with this. But I, I like so, the too. idea of the human character who comes in um, and, like, sees what's going on and is sort of the catalyst for what is happening even if they're not the main character like they could be they're definitely at least one of them because it would really be a shame if they showed up and then disappeared from the story um but it doesn't have to be all about them now the thing that i would say we gotta think about at this point if we're making the hog sentient is like is there a deeper meaning to this story where like do the hogs like in like sort of the deeper i guess message of your story do the hogs represent something like, do these represent a, or are they like the X-Men who might represent marginalized people? All right. Because then you have to deal with stuff there because then you can't really treat them like a different species. They have to be personified as fully human, um, which is one of the things in fantasy. Some people are like, Oh, if you have a bad race of orcs, then that's racist. It's like, no, they don't represent people. They're just the manifestation of, of evil. It's not like, oh, if you raise a orc in a nice caring home, will they be okay? It's like, have you seen how they're born? They're born as giant muddy warriors. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> did you watch the thing? You know, so it's um it but it depends on what you're doing because there are fantasy stories that do that kind of thing. All right. Or Star Trek in the original series, the Klingons were kind of representative of the Russians in the original series. All yeah. right. But there's also an episode in that where, you know, the Klingons and the Federation are butting heads, but there's also an episode where the Klingons and the Federation are being played against each other by this other force. And then they realize it and they start to work together. Like, yeah, they have a different vibe, <laughs> you know, they are different, but they like the Klingons actually do at least some of the time in Star Trek represent people. So you have to also like, this is one of those things to think about with the hogs. Cause if you're just like, Oh, well 
the hogs are a minority, then it's like, well, then you're just calling them pigs and that there's going to be <laughs> someone who's not happy about that. Yeah. Yeah, um, true. And I'm going to be like, dude, you know, <laughs> like, let's, let's another, another um, bright situation over here. Yuck. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of places that we got to go with this story. <laughs> and we could talk to you for hours and hours and yeah. hours. We actually might have to have you come back on so we can finish working over this story. Uh, I would love to come back. Yeah. yeah. No, this is really cool, man. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> this has been our show. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out and making another weird project with us mm -hmm. and, and, and for us yeah. and for Dylan to uh, write. Uh, this has been uh, finally Alien Uplift, where uh, I think now it's going to be Hogs getting thumbs and figuring out how they're not minorities because it's weird uh but if you want to check out <laughs> check out on this or anything else mm -hmm. any other weird projects we're doing you can always mm -hmm. go to uh, some nobodies.com if you really want to be our friend and help us make more and more things including uh, a movie that we got going on a board game over dylan's uh one of his train ideas uh or even a theme park based on the blade runner universe uh then head over at patreon.com backslash some nobodies uh some people that we really want to say thank you to other than mr peter j.s regan uh scott curtis from behind the bits we have uh mick manhattan over at scene snobs you have jeff dwoskin with the jeff dwoskin show uh sarah takachik you have tonya Sheck listener app if you're on instagram go to at the greatest podcast app uh very very cool thing uh but more importantly if you're into podcasts at all please go check out peter presents uh homer's iliad uh obviously you could tell by listening to this he is extremely educated very uh, passionate, <laughs> very passionate. <laughs> and uh you know can obviously talk the sum of that book so that's great uh so please go check that out go check out anything but until next time guys i've been zach he's been dylan he's been peter regan and you have been great thank you so much talk to you later i don't know take it easy fine. out there everybody <laughs> cheers everybody thanks for tuning